Welcome to John Redmond, Power of Attorney, the show that aims to empower you through knowledge of the law. I'm John Redmond. And I'm Shauna Sanford. Welcome to the show. The Orleans Parish Municipal Court. Sure, you've heard of it. Perhaps you've been there, but how much do you know about the inner workings of that court system? It has come under scrutiny, but the judges have been praised for how they handled misdemeanor cases, how they've helped reduce the caseload at criminal court, are moving cases through more quickly, and convicting more defendants. Municipal Court is the focus of today's show. It's a type of court you'll find in big cities across the country, and New Orleans is no exception. Today, we're glad to have Chief Judge Desiree Charbonnet on the show to help us talk about the need to knows of municipal court. That's right. Well, what can you expect when going through municipal court? What tools are available if you can't afford legal counsel? Judge Charbonnet will answer those questions and many, many more when she joins us in just a few moments. But, John, why don't we sort of get the ball rolling here and tell us a little bit about municipal court. What is municipal court? Municipal court is a specialized court. It is one that is basically four the city of New Orleans. That is the New Orleans Municipal Court is for the city of New Orleans. It is one that has concurrent jurisdiction with many things that can be tried in the district court, the criminal district court at the corner of Tulane and Broad, and it handles misdemeanor cases. That is generally, a misdemeanor is generally a crime that is punishable by up to six months jail time, but it also handles cases that involve uh, other municipal ordinances, uh, noise ordinances, uh, domestic disputes, all kinds of things that um, can be misdemeanors, can be crimes, but can also be things that are, it's a, such a mixed bag. And I look forward to having Judge Charbonnet talk about that with us. Also, I want to explain briefly, municipal court fits into the system under the uh, rubric of criminal cases, not to be confused with our special system in um, New Orleans where we have civil court, mm -hmm. which is just down the street, mm -hmm. which handles civil cases, divorces, car accident cases, breach of contract cases, uh, where nobody's going to jail, mm -hmm. win or lose, but somebody might be winning some money or getting no money if they lose their case. And then there are the courts of appeal, which handle the appeals of all those courts. And then there's the Supreme Court in Louisiana. And then there's the federal court system, which is for federal cases, which is almost a mirror image, but across the whole country. Right, and again today our focus is going to be on municipal court. They handle a lot of cases and as we mentioned in that intro, perhaps a lot of people have heard of it, maybe even been there, but uh, there are a lot of questions about how it actually works. So coming up next, Chief Judge Desiree Charbonnet will join us with the answers to those questions and many more, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Well, today we give you a closer look inside Orleans Parish Municipal Court and some important information to help you navigate the court system and better understand how things work there. Chief Judge Desiree Charbonnet has been on the bench for more than five years, and she joins Power of Attorney today to share her experience and her knowledge. John, we have lots to get into, right? Absolutely. Judge Charbonnet, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, why don't you just give your own sort of, how do you explain to lay people what happens at municipal court? Well, first of all, thank you all for having me and giving me this opportunity to explain the court better to the public. Uh, municipal court is a court of concurrent jurisdiction. It's considered a limited jurisdiction court. We hear all um, variations or violations, I should say, of municipal ordinances that are crafted by the council and state misdemeanors that are drafted by the state legislature. Um, the municipal court can sentence someone to no more than six months in jail. Um, so that is the maximum penalty in terms of a jail sentence. Um, if that case were in felony court or criminal district court, obviously as a felony it would be the sentences vary, mm -hmm. um, but can go obviously to life and death, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But um, so municipal court originally only dealt with the municipal ordinances. Um, and not until about two years ago when the DA, Leon Canazaro, envisioned our court as the misdemeanor court for the city, did he bring the cases from criminal court over to our court. So we have taken on about 40% of criminal court's docket. Um, so now we are dealing with both the municipal ordinances and the state misdemeanors. All right, so let me, let me let's kind of compartmentalize things a little bit here. So uh, one of the things that has happened in recent times is our district attorney, Leon Canazaro, um, sort of 
didn't shuffle the deck, but he, he, he channeled all these misdemeanor cases that were being tried in the courthouse at Tulane and Broad, the uh -huh. criminal district courthouse, and channeled them over to the municipal courthouse and asked you guys over there to handle all of the misdemeanor cases, mm -hmm. the state uh, misdemeanor cases, along with those that you were already trying, so the courts, the judges in the criminal district courthouse at Tulane and Broad mm -hmm. could focus their efforts on the... The felonies. Felonies. The and things that scare everybody, the, the murders, the kidnapping, rapes, uh, heavy drug okay. distribution. What impact did that have on you guys? Uh, did that suddenly mean... Uh, Longer a hours? A mountain of cases that just... <laughs> more cases. Did they, did they, did, did they yeah, absolutely more cases. As I said earlier, it's 40% of the docket um, from criminal court. So it is definitely more cases. It's a lot more work. Um, we embrace the work. We make no complaints about it. We're happy to have the work. If it, if it provides better services for the city, which is our job, then mm -hmm. we're happy with that. Then mm -hmm. we're doing what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot more work. So you said 40%, but for our viewers out there in terms of numbers, you're talking oh, hundreds and hundreds of cases. Absolutely. Thousands of cases. Thousands of cases. Thousands of cases. And, and I thought, I made a quick list to, to break it down. Um, the, city, the types of city cases we get are disturbing the peace, trespass, public intoxication, um, batteries, simple possession of marijuana, truancy, animal violations, th things that are started by the SPCA. Mm -hmm. And the state cases are domestic abuse batteries, simple batteries, assaults, uh, concealed weapons, marijuana, drug paraphernalia. Um, I think that covers it all. Um, but that, that, that kind of shows you how the, the different ways they come to us. Now, you said something earlier, and John, you mentioned this earlier, too. It's a phrase. You said concurrent jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Why is that important for our viewers? What is it that they need to know about the concurrent jurisdiction? Well, it's important because the viewers need to understand that we can hear state cases. Basically, it's, it's a, it was a statute that was passed that gave us jurisdiction over not only the municipal ordinances, but also the state misdemeanors. And it's important for people to understand that because I think people think municipal court is just going to be the municipal ordinances, the city ordinances, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that's not the case any longer. For years and years and years, it was only municipal ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, so now with the state cases, it's state misdemeanors. Because right. my court can't sentence anyone up to more than six months. And that doesn't matter if that misdemeanor is heard at criminal court or in our court. Six months, six is, months the is the max. max. That's the max. Right. And again, just to, uh, to explain just a little bit further, there's um, laws that are, uh, that call for or describe crimes as misdemeanors that come from the legislature, which mm -hmm. are misdemeanors, and that there are uh, crimes that are called misdemeanors that come from ordinances, and mm -hmm. ordinances come from our city council? That is correct. Okay. They are the legislators. And if it comes from our city council, those would automatically fall within the jurisdiction of your court, the municipal court, correct? That's correct. All right. And now they're all, in order to try and streamline the process, all those are being handled by you, those judges along The four with judges you. at municipal court. And right. let me just make this one exception mm -hmm. that I just thought of. Um, if, you, if you have a felony charge at, at a criminal court mm -hmm. and a misdemeanor <coughs> tied to it, then that case is going to follow the felony court. The idea is not to break those up. Okay. These are standalone misdemeanors. Okay. You know, if you're if you're a felon with a firearm and you're caught distributing drugs, then you're going to be, you know, well, both of those are felonies anyway. Mm -hmm. But it, if you have a, mis a misdemeanor connected, that's going to stay at criminal court. Okay. It's just more efficient. It's more efficient. And let me clarify one thing too, because I didn't mention this when I was describing courts before. Um, children. Uh, they don't go into your court automatically and in the scheme of all the courts, uh, criminal court, if you're a child there's something called juvenile court. That's right. How does that relate to your court? Anyone under 17 goes to um, juvenile court. Once you turn 17, uh, as some people refer to it as, you're in big court. Um, so once you cross the line over 17, you're in big court. You're treated um, as an adult in the eyes of the law. That is correct. Okay. That is much better said than what I just said. <laughs> well, no, you know, but, Shana, I no I'm say, you're saying it in normal speak. I'm saying it in the well, lawyer speak. Well, sometimes at court, I have to use normal speak um, based on who I'm talking to, unfortunately. Well, of course, well, but we want to communicate yeah. 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 Well, Go you ahead. had asked me how it changed in the volume, and, and I wanted to give you a picture of the court and how it changed before. Before the state misdemeanors came over, we had one prosecutor um, that was a city prosecutor, mm -hmm. all right, a city attorney prosecutes city ordinances or violations of those ordinances. Then we had a, um, a domestic abuse, sort of a part-time person. They didn't come to court every day, but they would prosecute the domestic abuse charges that came under the city ordinance. Since that has changed, 
we don't get any domestic abuse city charges. We still keep that one prosecutor for the city ordinances. However, with the influx of the municipal, I mean, the misdemeanor cases from state court, we now have a general prosecutor for the state court, um, for the state cases, and a specified domestic abuse prosecutor. So a court that had two now has three prosecutors, and these, these state uh, prosecutors are full-time prosecutors. So they are, they are very aggressive about their work. They're very committed to their work. That's not to say the city attorneys were not, um, but they are part-time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit different, um, and uh, it has changed the whole makeup of the courtroom in terms of the everyday process and, and the way cases flow. It's it's a lot. Well, in fact, you've been praised really for how quickly you are moving the cases through. Mm -hmm. So kind of give us some idea of the sort of the timetable for these cases. And I'm sure I know that each case is different depending on, you know, what's going, but just right. sort of, you know, an idea. Mm -hmm. All right. So if, if it's a charge that you're arrested for, all right, so the police stop you, arrest you for whatever it may be, they're going to bring you to booking to lock up. You're going to be processed there. The law says that you have to have a judge review your case within 48 hours for a probable cause determination, 72 hours for the appointment of an attorney. Okay. All right, so those people need to be brought to court quickly, mm -hmm. all right, so we can determine whether there's probable cause. Probable cause basically is, do I have reason to have this person in jail? Mm -hmm. If I don't, then the law says I shall release them. Mm -hmm. The law also says I shall release them if, they, if a judge does not review their case in 48 hours. So if by the time they get to my court and it's been 72 hours and no judges reviewed that case. I have to let them go. I have to. It doesn't matter what they're charged with. And it could be, it could be sometimes it's a scary case, but they have to be let go. Have you to. don't have the discretion to say. Absolutely not. But it's not. a scary case. That's the law. It's the law. So, but that's not your concern. That's the people who are charged with watching them, the police, the, uh, the, sheriff, the sheriff, make sure they get them, and generally okay. they do a good job. Sure. Um, each judge has to sit one weekend. Um, each of the four judges at municipal court go to lockup every weekend. We rotate so that we will have reviewed them over the weekend because that's that time period where if you get arrested on Friday and you don't get to court until Monday, you're, you're way beyond the 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So we, we mm -hmm. go in on Saturdays and we'll review the cases. Okay. So getting back to court. So now you're brought to court. And um, you're going to be appointed a, a public defender. Everyone who's arrested is, arrest, is represented by a public defender. Every person, no matter your every status. Person every person in an orange jumpsuit. The assumption is they cannot afford an attorney, so mm -hmm. they are, it's assumed that they need a public defender at no charge mm -hmm. unless they say, I ha you know, right. my lawyer's coming. That's right. So do you, do John Redmond's on his way. He represents me, Judge. Well, we're going to pass on you until your attorney shows up. Oh, okay. And then, you know, because some people have lawyers. Right. Our family right. members have called lawyers to come and show up right. at arraignment. Right. Um, generally, you'll get, you know, they enter the plea, not guilty. We'll set them for trial. If that person, and I have to set a bond, mm -hmm. if that person can't make their bond, our procedure is to return them to court in 21 days for a trial. So it's it's a lot it's it's a rapid pace. So um, we figure you're sitting in jail in 21 days. We need to bring you back. Let's let's go to trial in this case. Mm -hmm. They're not always ready for trial. It could be either side. But that's basically the process. Now, if you bond out, or if I feel you're not a risk, sometimes a public defender will say this person has no history whatsoever, Judge. He's here on a disturbing the peace and something else. And can you give him an ROR? Release him on his own recognizance. I'm, I'm, I'm amenable to that mm -hmm. if they don't pose a threat to society. Mm -hmm. So that person will walk out without a bond. Now I'll make sure they understand you have an obligation to return to court. If not, I issue a warrant. You'll serve time for contempt. You know, so we'll go through that to make sure they understand the, the severity of, of missing court. Um, so, you know, from there, if I release them, they'll get a trial date to come back to mm -hmm. court. Mm -hmm. Some people plead at arraignment. Some wow. people decide right. to plead guilty. And then later on, they come back and see you and a trial is held? Yes, a trial is held. Now, I advise everyone of their right to an attorney. Um, some people come back without an attorney. If they are charged with something that it seems serious or they have a very long history of uh, convictions and charges, then I'll tell them, listen, you're facing a domestic abuse battery second. You have convictions. Second offense. Second offense. You've, you've already been convicted once, so it's now a second it's offense. It's now a second. That's what that means. You've got it in your jacket. You've got some armed robberies. You may have all kinds of other convictions. So listen, DA is going to put on the record that they're asking for you to serve the maximum jail time. You need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Maximum jail time again, up six months. Six, six months, months per enough. count. Per, per count. count. That's right. Okay. Per count. And, per they, count. and they put them sequentially, not concurrently. It's kind of up to the judge. Oh, okay. You know, the lawyers make the arguments. If you, if you. Depends on who's okay. best, and, and then at the end of the day, it's on us to decide. So okay. it can be concurrent, 
Okay. Or so not. Uh, interrupt you. I'm sorry. That's okay. So then, I um, <laughs> so then I, you know, I urge that they get a lawyer. And then, you know, it kind of goes into a point we wanted to right. discuss. And I don't mean to jump the gun with you, John. But yeah, then that brings up the issue of a public defender for you outside of court if you're not arrested. I mean, if you're not incarcerated any longer. And um, what we'll do typically um, when someone shows up for their arraignment, um, if they've not been arrested, I'll um, ask them if they're going to hire an attorney. It, you know, I will. Everybody needs an attorney, in my opinion, because no matter what, generally they're not attorneys, and you're going to be trying a case against someone who's been practicing law for a long time, uh -huh. an experienced attorney. And so what if you cannot afford an attorney? You, can, you don't have the funds for legal representation. Well, then I'm going to discuss with you some financial issues. I'm going to ask you if you're employed. How many dependents do you have? Where do you live? What do you make per hour? Um, things of that nature. Do and you, do you pay find rent? that happens a lot in your court, that a lot of oh, people cannot yeah. afford uh, attorneys? Yeah, just the vast know, majority of people that come are in It indigent. generally depends, but if if you make a hundred thousand a year, you don't get a free attorney. But if you make no. twenty thousand a year and you have a child, mm -hmm. are you going to qualify? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Good. Probably. I mean, we want to give people a general sense. I know it it can. It's not a guarantee mm -hmm. for every individual who. Right. No, I mean there. We all know there. Are, we have this reality called the working poor mm -hmm. in our country, mm -hmm. and that's very true. And even though someone is working, doesn't mean they can afford an attorney. Right. Yeah. And you know, again, you ask if they have a child, depending on how many dependents you have. So, yeah. what I have to do is give credit to the public defender's office here. They have set up a full staff in our court. We've given them space in our court. When somebody comes to me and says, "Judge, I can't afford an attorney," I said, "Like I say, I told you to come back with an attorney. I can't afford one." Okay. I said, "Listen." Go and speak to the public defender's office. See see where they fall. You know, if they if you fall within the guidelines, it has to do with the poverty level. Then they'll bring them back and they'll come in with a piece of paper that says that listen, we're going to represent this individual. And it will be there's two public defenders in my court. I did leave that out. And I'm um, going to have to ask, ask you to make that point as soon as we come back yeah. because All we right, do we'll have to take a there. quick break. But we will come back and okay. let you finish that thought. And when we come back, our viewer questions about municipal court and how it all works. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you.